Hi, and welcome to Far From Home with me, Mabel Nainan. And today we have with us Daniel Montanez again to finish the last part of our conversation based on his book. I have it here, The Church and Migration, A Theological Vision for the People of God. We've been using this book as a basis for our conversation. So if you're interested, this book is available wherever books are sold. So go online and buy it. And let us know your thoughts in the Facebook group, or you can write to me, to Daniel. I will put his email address too in the comments so you can get in touch with him and tell us about your thoughts on our conversation and on even on the book. And we'd be very happy to hear from you. So welcome back, Daniel. Thank you so much. It's been a, such a pleasure doing these episodes with you, and I'm looking forward to our final conversation together. Yeah, me too. And, you know, in one way, I don't want them to end because there's yeah. <laughs> so much <laughs> to talk about. And we, we spoke about such important topics, so relevant. Mm -hmm. And we ended last week on the theme of hospitality. And I want to pick up there because chapter eight uh, talks about hospitality. Wilmer Estrada Carasquillo does such an excellent job of explaining that concept to us. And he gives a biblical foundation for why Christians should be hospitable. He points out specifically an example in the Bible. He uses Abraham's narrative there. Can you tell us why that is important? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, chapter eight was written by Dr. Wilma Estrada Carasquillo, and his chapter is called The Call to Hospitality, Entertaining Angels. So we, we included this chapter particularly because one of the interesting narratives that we have found in related to migration throughout the Christian scriptures is oftentimes when an angel comes to a person's home or to a person's house, the way in which a person treats them or engages with them as a visitor, whether the, the, the person chooses to show hospitality or not, will have an impact and an effect on how the rest of the narrative of that story goes. So it's always been such an interesting dimension within the grand narrative of the scripture that we wanted to take some time to highlight it. But as the story goes, Abraham extends hospitality to three men who come to visit him. Uh, and these three men are, are understood to be angels or, or in a sense, heavenly or heavenly hosts in this type of way who are coming to his door. And at that, at that moment, Abraham and Sarah readily let them in, readily show hospitality to them, radical hospitality even. They begin to, what he does is he offers them water to wash their feet. Oftentimes in the ancient Near East, people would travel from long passages. So to offer them water would in a sense be a, a sense of relief of care to, to help them clean up in that type of way. He offers them food, he offers them bread, as well as offering one of his choice calves for them to eat. Uh, which again is important because we don't, he, 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 back then you wouldn't know when was the last time a person ate or when would be the next time that a person would eat. So making sure that a person took good care of them in that way was important. And he, pro he provided them a, a place to rest. It says that there that there is a tree in which he offered uh, for them to take some time to relax and relax. And oftentimes on these journeys that people would take, finding some type of place to take a break. I mean, I just think about Oftentimes when I'm at home working all day, I just go and lay in bed for a good 20 minutes and take a power nap and how valuable that is for me. But for, for those who were on, on, on a journey, sojourning through, through their, through, through the, through the desert, having a place in which they could come and rest was vitally important for them. So this is something that, that Abraham practices and it's significant because it's something similar to what, what the scripture teaches Christians uh, to do later on within the, the 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 Bible in Hebrews chapter thirteen verse two, it reminds the Christian to do not to not forget to show hospitality to the stranger, for by doing so some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So in that type of way, it's 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 critically important to care for those because we don't know what their story is, where they come from, and and it may and it goes on to say that it may be Christ Himself who is mm. visiting. It's mm -hmm. important for us to really care for people in their time of need. And I believe that that Abraham was, in a sense, speaking out of his own experience uh, as a migrant. You know, in, in Genesis chapter 12, it says that God commanded him to go from his country, to leave his relatives and his father home to a land in which he would show them. So Abraham himself knew the experience of what it meant to sojourn, to be a migrant, to be a, to, to be a traveler. So he was in a place where he was readily he had the ready disposition 
to serve them in their time of need as well. Yeah. And I mean, some people might say that kind of hospitality was acceptable during those days at that time and in his culture, but that these days, you know, we probably don't have to go to that extent or do so much. What would you say to that? Yeah, so I the the call to hospitality is something I think that is a clear teaching within scripture. It's not something that's necessarily conditional. Of course, I mean, yes, it was a different time period per se in which the sociocultural context was different. However, that does not mean that the social context, cultural context in which we find ourselves today, that we are nullified uh, to that call to to show radical hospitality to those who are in need. And if the context is ever shifting, then we as well must be willing to ever, to ever shift as well to those changing contexts so that we can show the same level of radical hospitality to those in the equivalent way as it would have been understood back then. Mm -hmm. So we uphold that virtue, that Christian virtue, the context might change, the time might change, but we still, like you said, have to practice that virtue because it's part of our identity as a Christian. That's absolutely becomes, right. Yeah. So I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Some people, again, <laughs> coming up with <laughs> all the reasons why you shouldn't practice it or, you know, say some say that I'm not wired like that or it's not my gift. I serve the church through other ways. So what do you say to that? That only maybe few Christians possess this gift. It's a spiritual gift and it's not everyone's calling to be hospitable. Yeah, that's 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 a great question. And I mean, there are definitely those who are more introverted as well as those who are more extroverted. So I mean, there are also those modern day conversation that conversational dynamics when it comes to practicing certain types of spiritual giftings in that type of way. I, I think there there's no doubt that there are those who have been given the gift of hospitality, those who mm -hmm. really find joy, who who love to do it in that in that type of way. Uh, and serve others. People open up their homes to host small groups within within their local church and then bring people in, providing food, hospitality, conversations. They 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 live off of that. And there are, I mean, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are those who have the gift. However, it's also important to know that, and this is something that I, I think about as well. The Christian life is not bound to our personality types. Oftentimes there's like mm -hmm. all these different types of like the Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram, those types of things that are in place. And a person says, I'm a, I'm, so I'm a nine on the, on the Enneagram, which is like a peacemaker. So I have the temptation to say, well, because I'm a nine, that means I cannot function or do anything as an eight or a seven or a one. Those types of things are just not within my capacities because my personal personality disposition is to go and act in a particular direction. However, the Christian identity is not like that. Mm. <laughs> uh, the Christian <laughs> identity is one that calls us beyond our comfort levels, beyond who we are. And rather than saying, this is who I am, what God says is, this is who I call you to be. And that's not to say that God is calling every single person to be extroverted or introverted to, to serve in a particular type of way. But it does go to say that the virtue of hospitality is something that every Christian should practice in some type of way, because that mm. is one of the issues in which the, the scriptures teach us towards. Yeah, thank you for explaining that well. I had something to say about that, but it just skipped my mind. <laughs> but anyway. It's okay, there was and a I, lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was thinking about something to say, and maybe it'll come back to me later on. But mm. in this chapter, what was eye-opening to me was Estrada Carasquillo talks about the hospitable personhood of God. That's so beautiful. Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Wilmer could probably explain this better than I could, but because he, he wrote the chapter. But I mean, when he speaks about the hospitable personhood of God, I mean, I think he's talking about just the nature of who God is and how you see God's hospitality within creation. He goes on to explain how creation is an act of God and that it is something that is a free act. It is something that he does out of his own accord. And, and with that, he he creates this world out of an abundance of his love and an out of an abundance of his grace. 
So because God is loving and because God shows grace, he creates this world around us. And God also, and, and he, he makes an important point of that, God also establishes a relationality to creation. He, he establishes a relationality to us, to human beings, that in a sense, God created a home for us to live in and to dwell in. And, and, and he himself opens up his home to us so that we could live, dwell, flourish, and thrive in this type of way. So in God's act of his abundance, his omniscience, his omnipotence, he chooses to share that with his creation. He chooses to, to create us, to give us this world, and to make us in his image so that we can also share in the goodness of who God is. Wow. Yeah. That was, like I said, eye-opening to me, and I really enjoyed reading that portion, and you explained it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was. I, I hope I'd be able to. He. I mean, it's a very beautiful and deep concept in which uh, yeah. I share, so thank you. Mm-hmm. Now, moving on to the, the next chapter in the book, Carolyn Dirksen. She talks about the sojourner identity of a Christian in the Bible, and some a topic that's also very close to my heart. Why is it that the early church was able to embrace this identity easily or they just grasped it and you felt like they they knew um, that they were sojourners on earth and they lived it out? You didn't have to convince them. Why was it that they were able to do it so well? Yeah, that is that is an excellent question. And in order for us to fully understand this, I mean, I think it's important for us to understand the the social context from which Israel was existing at the time of the early church. If you're familiar with the biblical narrative, you know that uh, Israel was once a great nation. However, I think it was around 536 AD, they fell to the Babylonian Empire, uh, or 586 BC, as when they fell to the Babylonian Empire. And there they experienced a type of forced migration and displacement. And eventually when they returned to Jerusalem, they found themselves in this continual place of displacement within these larger superstructure countries that surrounded them, the Persian Empire, the 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 Greco, or yeah, it was the, the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. So the people of Israel after really the Babylonian fall, they never really found themselves in a place where they were really rulers again and kind of this strong nation. So they found themselves internally displaced within these larger systems in in in, mm-hmm. in in Rome. So they themselves, as minoritized people, they found themselves in a place where they could where they understood what it meant to be a sojourner, what it what it meant to be displaced. So for them, uh, yeah, for them it, it was just something that that they understood as as part of their cultural identity. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so she also says in her chapter that they are sojourners and aliens in a hostile world to their beliefs, but wherever they are, God is with them. And that place then becomes holy ground. Yeah. Wow. That's nice. And I also think for them, it was a visceral lived experience because like she pointed out, it was in ho- a hostile environment. Not everybody was okay with the the teachings of Jesus or following him. So mm-hmm. in a way they stood out, they were misfits for believing in Jesus and for practicing a new way of life. It was foreign to everyone. So Mm. I think, uh, and to put it in, to see it from modern day lens, that's why I think she she says that somewhere in the chapter, I'm not sure, that in cultures or countries where Christians are persecuted and they are the minority, it's again, easier for them because they already stand out and they are outsiders. So they can embrace their pilgrim identity better. Absolutely. They're speaking from a position of marginalization mm-hmm. and it's in the margins that they can, they can understand that sojourner reality. And even Paul himself in, in, in the, in his letters, he speaks of vowing eternal citizenship over earthly citizenship and that we are not to, that we are, that Christians are not necessarily given a home in this world in the same way. Uh, so to look towards this eternal citizenship, and that's really where he places the value as Christian, as as part of the Christian identity. So even that, we see that valuing through the, the teachings of Paul. Yeah. So why is it difficult for Christians in the West, especially American Christians, to 
to live out this aspect of their identity or to see themselves as foreigners on earth? Yeah, that's that's another great question. I mean, I think as as we analyze the social and historical context of the people of Israel, I think it's important for us to understand the the social and historical context of the United States as well. Kind of that 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 notion, that perception of American exceptionalism, which has developed over time and kind of many times the the narrative of the United States being painted one as victory, as one as strong, rather than what Israel experience, which was one as being that that lost weak. Uh, mm-hmm. and was weak in that type of way. The the perception is 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 different for for many in the way in which they they understand themselves as part of their their American identity as opposed to Israel's identity during the period of of, of Bible. I think as well, there is always the temptation for generational amnesia uh-huh. that the, the farther and farther away a person comes. Uh, goes from their ancestors, their ancestral journey from one place to another, the more likely they are to forget who they are. Uh, and when a person mm-hmm. to forget who they are, then they lose that sense of identity. And this is part of the reason why the reading of the law was so important in, in mm-hmm. early Jewish culture and in the practicing of traditions, because it was important for them to remember who they were as, as a people and how God had delivered them out of the hand of Pharaoh in, in Exodus and, and the call to show hospitality to strangers for you are once sojourners in the land of Egypt. All of these different components of their identity were important to maintain and to hold as part of their understanding as, as a Jewish people. And I think oftentimes, whether it be in the United States or other, other, other national, cultural contexts, it's easy to begin to forget one's story. And when one forgets yeah. one's story, one loses one's identity yeah. along the way. And especially when you're feeling comfortable, and I think Christians here have that proximity to power. They mm-hmm. they know they have the power and, and the influence, and they're also wealthy. And so that can make us complacent in a way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. How can pilgrim, pilgrim Christians, sorry, or diaspora believers be considered a gift to the American church? Yeah, that's a great, that, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think Carolyn speaks about this a little bit in her chapter. By the mm-hmm. way, Erickson, amazing professor emeritus from the university in, in, in Cleveland, Tennessee. But she wrote this chapter. Uh, and, and I think one of the st- statistics that she wrote was that over 61% of immigrants in the United States today are Christians, which is a very interesting statistic for us to understand. And and yeah, I think it 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 makes part of 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 that understanding of kind of how uh, many immigrants are coming already with the Christian faith in a sense this type of shared value system. Uh, oftentimes, I've I've been on mission trips where people go to maybe the, the U.S. Mexico border and they expect to do evangelism and bring people to Christ, and and there is that language barrier, so there's not the full realization of of what the other person is saying and. When you speak to these people, you realize that there is a very vibrant Christian faith that already exists mm. within a, a, a place like Mexico. And many people from, from other, other parts of, of Latin America and, and other countries do carry this type of Christian faith. So uh, it's important for us to, to remember that, yeah. even the way in which we understand missions and in our world today. And I mean, it's it's a blessing and it, it's, it's a blessing and a gift to the American church because in a sense it can help the church return to its original identity. It can bring this type of refreshment, this type of renewal to the understanding that the church itself was originally a, a, a migrant community. It was an immigrant church. So as immigrants come to the United States, I think rather than respond in a, in a manner of, of hostility, rather we can respond in a way to understand uh, that we are in a sense, they are in a sense a reminder to us from God to return that that call to remember where you, where you came from that call from God to our own Christian identity in this world. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think it's fitting to end our conversation by talking about the role of the church in welcoming and ministering to immigrants and some of it you just touched upon right now. So in chapter 10, Chris Ramasandar brings out important truths about church and migration. And he points to an important moment in Israel's history when Solomon dedicates the temple and then he prays a beautiful prayer. So can you tell us more about that? 
and what its connection is with immigrants or migration. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, in, in uh, he, he quotes Chris Ramzundar, he, he wrote chapter 10, he quotes Second Chronicles chapter 32 and 33, and I'll just read the passage real quickly, Yeah, which says, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, and do uh, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. Mm. We see here this prayer that 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 takes place to God, and 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 one of the things that 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 Solomon is doing in his dedication of of this temple, of this great temple, this first temple that is built, is that he remembers the sojourner, he remembers the immigrants, and he he prays for them, he includes them in that type of way. And the passage goes on to say that God accepted their the this offering and the sacrifices, and a great fire came down and consumed it, representing this type of approval from God of 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 what Solomon was doing and the message and the words in which he was bringing to, to, to his people. So I think with that, we see in this passage that the, that the, that, that the sojourner, that the migrant was dignified first and foremost, mm-hmm. uh, and, and was remembered. Mm-hmm. The immigrant was remembered and the immigrant was dignified. So also in the same way, we as Christians, the church today should remember immigrants in our world today and, and, and work to towards their their dignity within mm. society and ask ourselves what does it mean to restore uh, that type of dignity and remember them and the work and in the ministries that we engage in. Yeah, it's amazing to think that that was part of almost a national prayer, mm-hmm. right? So to include intercession on behalf of foreigners. And that was so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing because th- the fingerprints of the sojourner are all over Christian scripture and God is present with them. And as you, as you, as you continue to search the scriptures and understand God's positionality and God's posture towards, towards the migrant, we, we, we begin to see that God loves and cares for, for the migrant and, and, and for their well-being. There's a special place in God's heart for, for that community. Yeah. And one of the reasons is, I think, also because foreigners are vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And I've experienced this, even though I would consider myself a more privileged immigrant, you know, because my husband already had a job. So we came here with things settled for us. We didn't have to learn the language, but still not knowing anyone, not knowing anything for the longest time, it makes you feel vulnerable. And even the little help that someone gives you, or even someone I remember spoke kindly to me, it used to mean so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I would, in the first few weeks at least, I would think I forgot in the voice, my own voice, because I've hardly spoken to anyone. <laughs> wow. I used to only wow. talk on the phone and just be quiet the whole time because I had not yet made friends. And so I think there is that vulnerability and they can be taken advantage of. They are without family, without community, without a support system. And also just not knowing can put you in a dangerous spot, not knowing what to do, how to work systems out. Uh, But it's just so good and comforting to hear God's heart for the foreigner. And in my own experience, I've seen God provide and be there for us and be so faithful even when we didn't have you know family or when we were in the process of building up community during those times he becomes you know father mother friend and he provides and helps in amazing ways and it has shown me that God is in the details and no matter where I go he's always there so to me it's been a blessing and it has faith wise it has strengthened me made me depend on him and see him come through in amazing ways. Yeah, yeah. so I'm grateful for that. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much for talking with us. We did three episodes, so almost an hour and a half or two hours of your time. And we hope that our audience 
are enlightened, encouraged, blessed. And, and I think I can speak for you and as well that we hope that this conversation would motivate them to think of migration through a biblical lens and adopt a posture of hospitality, love, generosity, kindness toward immigrants, because that's what the Bible teaches us. So thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor and privilege.